<laughs> but I want to say good morning to all of you and thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's so good to see all of you again um, and to be up here at the church that I grew up in. It's kind of surreal. Um, and a lot of you may be wondering like, why I'm up here, and Ryan just kind of explained to it, and I'm kind of wondering why I'm up here, but um, I'm excited to share with you what I'm going to share with you today. <laughs> um, so, uh, back in November, Ryan had asked me if I wanted to preach on the 27th uh, while I was home for Christmas break, and my first reaction was, no way, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, you, like I've only done one semester of Bible college. Uh, I... No. <laughs> maybe we'll wait till summer. Maybe we'll wait till I get two years under my belt. I haven't even taken a class in how to preach. Uh, but after some convincing and a lot of prayer, uh, I kind of I decided to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, while I was trying to figure out what I was going to be preaching on, I knew um, I knew that I had to preach the gospel because it has impacted my life so deeply and so immensely and it has been central to every decision I have made and every decision I will make and is everything and is central to everything we as Christians believe. Um, and though I've been a believer and a follower of Jesus since I was like six years old, it has been a year, this year in particular that the gospel has really gripped my heart and transformed my mind and significantly changed the projection of my life. Um, and the beautiful thing is that it's still doing this and will continue to do this for the rest of my life. For those of you who don't know what the gospel is, that might be a foreign word, or maybe you're just a little unclear or you need a reminder, uh, the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ and what he did for us on the cross. There's so much to it, but in summary, um, the good news is that we are all sinners and that we all miss the mark. All of humanity, every single person, is inherently sinful, broken, and separated from God. But this is not how it was supposed to be and not how God created it. But because of the fall, that's when Adam and Eve first sinned against God in the Garden of Eden. The only thing that we justly deserve is death and damnation. But even though we're like that, God in his immense grace, which is his undeserved favor to us, and his great mercy, which is him not giving us what we deserve, which is death, and because of his deep, deep love for us and each and every one of us, he gave, he gave his dearly beloved son Jesus to live the perfect life that we are incapable of living and to die on the cross for us, because of us, and instead of us, so that all, and I mean it all, absolutely every single person, who puts their faith in him will be made right with God and be declared as righteous, as blameless, as perfectly good before God and will be able to enjoy a relationship with him and other people forever. Now, I think that's pretty good news. <laughs> and I don't know, or, but I know that before this summer, I often viewed the gospel as, as a one-dimensional, one-time kind of thing that occurs when you repent and believe in Jesus and are saved, and then from there you just move into deeper and better things. And I don't know if any of you have viewed the gospel like that before, or if this is how you're currently thinking of it, or maybe you just really haven't thought of it. Um, but I remember when I was attending the village church in Surrey, which is where I went to church while I was attending Trinity Western, um, and their pastor, Mark Clark, preached the gospel over and over, and Sunday after Sunday, and the word for word, I remember saying this, I say, um, why is he always talking about the gospel? I mean, isn't that for unbelievers? I've been a believer for like 13 years. I think I already know this stuff. Like, where, where is the deeper stuff? But it's been made so absolutely apparent to me um, over the last, over the summer and the last four months while at Miller uh, that the gospel is the deeper stuff. And it is for absolutely everybody, believers or not. It's not just something we move past, but something we center ourselves around and something that we move deeper into. And we will never find the end of it. Um, J.D. Greer, in his book, Gospel, Recovering the Power that Made Christianity Revolutionary, which I had to read for one of my classes this semester at Miller, says that the gospel is not merely the diving board off of which you jump, jumped into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is the pool itself. So keep going deeper into it. You'll never find the bottom. 
And uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 10 and 12 says that concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently with the greatest care. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even the angels long to look into these things. It says that even the angels who are these divine, eternal, powerful beings who live in God's eternal presence even they long to look into the mystery and the power and the beauty of the gospel and they cannot get enough of it. I mean, I just picture it's like Christmas morning and Michael and Gabriel and all the other angels are gathered around the Christmas tree and they're like looking and they're looking to see what this mysterious gift is and they're all pushing and shoving just trying to get a look at it because they can't get enough of it. And it's the most beautiful thing they've ever seen. And then there's Lucifer just sitting in the background like, Whatever. Lucifer's the devil, by the way, if anyone doesn't know that. He was, was an angel. Um, no, the gospel is so much bigger than it ever made it out to be. It's not just the gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although they are a pretty big part of it. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, and it is the entire Bible, start to finish, and it is the incredible, messy, and beautiful, and intricate story that it tells us of redemptive history, and the incredible, uh, and God has this amazing plan to bring us, his people, whom he loves dearly despite the fact that we've rejected him, back to himself so that we can enjoy him forever. And at the very center of the story is Jesus' life and the work that he did for us on the cross. Everything written before that was pointing towards Jesus, and everything written after that is pointing back to Jesus, and then forward to when he returns and makes everything new and perfect again. And it's also not just the initial salvation from the penalty of sin or an eternity of damnation, although it certainly is that, and that is super important, but it's also a daily, moment-by-moment -moment salvation from the power of sin and the brokenness of this world. As we are made to be more like Christ and become the people that God desires us to be, to love like Christ loves and treats other, treat others as Christ treated others. But then also with the freedom that it's okay not to be perfect because Christ is perfect and we are made right with God by faith and not by what we do or what we do not do. And on top of that, the gospel is the final eternal salvation from the presence of sin where we get to be in God's glorious presence forever and ever and there's no sin and there's no brokenness and there's no evil and there's no death and there's no decay or tears or sickness or anything and it gets to be like how God created it initially and it will be absolutely incredible. It has become so wonderfully clear to me that the gospel can and will impact literally every single aspect of your life if you let it. And it will result in doing the things that God has called us to do and being the people that God desires us to be. And if we do those things, it will be far more fulfilling and far more satisfying and far greater than anything we could ever imagine or do on our own. For God is a plan for each and every one of us, and he calls us into that. And, yeah. Um, and it all starts, all of this starts with believing the good news of the gospel, and it all continues by pressing into it more and more. Um, so, back in the beginning of November, I took a church planting modular course, so I took one course over the course of a week um, with a guy named Johnny Thiessen from C to C Church Planting Organization, which is actually Ryan's church planting mentor, and he actually oversees our church plant here in Sparrow. So it's really kind of a cool collision of worlds as I got to meet him and learn from him and be mentored by him, who's also teaching Ryan and who's Ryan's learning from. Um, and in his class, he stressed the importance of gospel-centeredness in all that we do. Um, and through, while he was explaining this, he used, or he gave an interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan, um, which I had never heard before, but it impacted me greatly because it so clearly portrayed the message of the gospel. So I'm going to share that with you guys today. Um, and we're going to go ahead and read it. But first, before we do, uh, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to give you kind of the big idea behind the message. So you guys want to bow your heads with me. I need all the help I can get. <laughs> Uh, God, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we could come together uh, in fellowship and in community and to sing praises to you and sing songs and to hear your word of God or hear your word. Um, God, be with each and every one of us here. I pray that your Holy Spirit fills this place and moves in each and every one of our hearts. 
And God, uh, please be with me as I deliver this message. I pray in your holy name. Um, so, my the big idea behind this message and the interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan is that the only way we can be like the Good Samaritan in this story is if we first recognize Jesus as the ultimate Good Samaritan. So while we're reading the parable, I just want you to read it as if you're a character in the story. And I'm going to give you a little heads up. Uh, you're not the Good Samaritan. <laughs> not yet, at least. Not yet, at least. Um, and I know this because the Bible isn't primarily about us. It's about Jesus. Um, so open up your Bibles, if you have them, to Luke chapter 10. And we're going to start at verse 25. And if you don't have a Bible, there's one in front of the seat. Uh, and if you don't know where that is, that's okay because it's going to come up behind me on the screen here. And uh, we're just going to read it in its entirety first. Um, so Luke 10 verse 25. And behold, the, lo- the lawyer stood up to him, to the t- or stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, All who is my neighbor, or, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But as, or but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sent him on his own animal and brought him to the inn and took care of him. And the next day he took two, out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you are, or, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these there do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him great, or one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, "You go and do likewise." So right away, uh, we have the lawyer, who is a religious leader of the time, maybe similar to like a priest or a deacon or a pastor even. Um, And he's testing Jesus by asking him what he must do to have eternal life. Um, Now, his first mistake, which Jesus picks up on, is that he is trying to earn his own way to eternal life. He asks, what can I do? This lawyer would have been similar to the Pharisees in that he was an expert of the law, which is the give or take 600 or so commandments given by God to the Jewish people back when they were wandering the desert with Moses. And he would have known it inside and out and would have religiously withheld its requirements and would have forced it on people to do the same. Um, So he knew the law and he's familiar with it. So that's why Jesus, who is also an expert of the law, because he kind of wrote it, um, he points the lawyer back to the law when he asks how he can earn his eternal life. Um, He turns him back to the law because the law was never meant to save us. It was given us to show that we need to be saved. Um, And Romans 3 verse 20 tells us that... uh, Romans 3 verse 20 tells us that, For by works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Um, The whole point of the law is only to show how sinful we are and how we can't do anything about that. Um, so when the man responds correctly with the fact that one must love God with all, his, with all their heart and soul and mind and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself, he is right. He is right in saying that. That is what you have to do to be made right with God. And that's why Jesus responds with, do this and you will live. If you perfectly love God and you perfectly love your neighbors, you will have eternal life. But the only problem is that we as humans are incapable in our own strength to ever do this. We can't fulfill the law or perfectly obey its commands by our own volition. 
because we are inherently sinful and will undoubtedly sin throughout our lives. Now, the lawyer's second mistake is that he tries to justify himself, like he's trying to save himself again, by asking Jesus, well then, who do you define as our neighbor? Because maybe if the stipulations of who our neighbor is is more lenient, then we might be able to fulfill that law. We might be able to love our neighbors if, if who our neighbors is, are are only the people who live directly beside us, if who our neighbors are are only the people that we like, or if they're just like us, if they look like us. Um, but Jesus, in his usual fashion, takes the requirements of the law and shows us how they are even more difficult to withhold than we could ever imagine. He tells us that our neighbor is absolutely everyone and anyone, even if they are our enemy. And this is because he's the only person capable of fulfilling this. And he's the only person who came, and as he lived his life, he loved his enemies perfectly. He loved everyone the same. He just expressed it differently. And that is why he tells the story of the Good Samaritan to the lawyer. Now the whole story centers around a man who was on his way from Jerusalem to Jericho and it was a popular route back in the day for people from the temple and just Jewish people coming and going from Jericho and Jerusalem. Um, and it was notorious dangerous due to its winding curves and its rocky terrain. Um, so it was known for bandits lurking in the shadows and jumping out and mugging people. Um, so while he was walking, he was jumped by a group of bandits and who mugged him and beat him and left him half dead on the side of the row, broke, road, broken and bruised. Now, I've never been half dead before, but I imagine that there's not a whole lot you can do to help yourself at this point. Things are looking pretty grim for this guy. Now, the th- closest thing I can think of is this one time where my dad and my sister and I were out hunting, and we were riding our horses early in the morning, and, and we were trying to get there for first light, and it's freezing cold outside, and me and my sister are doing all that we can do to stay warm on the back of, my ho- on the back of our horses. Somehow, my, ma- my dad manages to do it without a problem. But, um, old man's strength. Yeah, <laughs> definitely old man strength. Um, but, so, my dad's out front, and I'm in the middle, and my sister's in the back, and she is bundled up and trying to stay as warm as she can and she's got her toque down to here and she's got her collar up to here and she's just nuzzled down like this head down just trying to stay warm and sure enough as we're going down this path there's a low hanging branch and my dad sees it and he ducks and I see it and I duck and just as I learn, look back and yell Camille look out for the she's off her horse she's taken off by the branch and she's laying there beaten broken and bruised on the side of the path <laughs> incapable of helping herself until my dad and I come to her rescue. (laughs) So this man is lying on the side of the road completely helpless and by chance a priest comes walking down the same path but instead of stopping and helping this man he passes by on the other side of the road. It's not that he goes and investigates and then carries on. It's simply that he just doesn't want anything to do with this guy. He just goes on the complete other side of the road. Um, And we could think of some possible excuses for why he did this. Um, Sorry. (laughs) Who knew your mouth gets so dry when you talk a lot? (laughs) Um, But, so there's some excuses we could think of for why he did this. He uh, could have maybe had a sermon to preach at the temple and he just didn't have time. Um, He could have maybe viewed it as dangerous and thinking maybe if I stop and help this guy I might end up in the same position as him. Um... Or he could not have wanted to risk touching a dead man, for according to the law, that would make him ceremonially unclean and unable to fulfill his religious duties, like making his sacrifices. Um, But regardless of what his reasons were, he neglected to help this man and left him to die on the side of the road. And then a Levite, who is very similar to a priest, passes by and does the very same thing. Now, before we all rush it to point out how awful of people the priest and the Levite were, I have to admit that I am guilty of doing the same thing, probably multiple times. Now, in my instance, nobody was close to dying or anything, but there was one time when my sister and I were driving into town. It has nothing to do with her this time. <laughs> uh, we were driving into town on my way to school, and as we're driving, I see someone's in the ditch. Uh, they just kind of slid off the side of the road, lost control, and they, they, were, they were fine, but they were in the ditch, and they were talking on the phone, probably calling for someone to have help, or for help. And some of you may know this person, it was Blake Peebles, and I was driving in, he's a neighbor of ours. He's like literally my neighbor and my friend, and I grew up with him, <laughs> and I see him on the side of the road talking on the phone, and by the time I like kind of took it in that 
he was off the road and it was Blake and that someone needed help. I was already like almost past him. I decided in my mind, kind of concluded that, oh, it'd probably be too dangerous for me to stop and lock up my brakes because I might end up in the same place as him and I'll be late for school if I stop and I couldn't help him anyways because I'm driving a Honda Civic. <laughs> So I just kind of panicked and kept driving. And my sister looks at me, she's like, aren't you going to stop? And I was like, ah. Uh, and I just kept driving because I didn't know what to do. And despite her telling me that I was a terrible, awful person, I just drove all the way into school. And uh, when, when Blake showed up about an, an hour later, late for school, I just kind of like looked the other way and pretended that I didn't see anything and never addressed the issue. <laughs> And so, Blake, if you're ever listening to this, I apologize deeply, and I'll help you out next time. Uh, but I've repented and asked for forgiveness, so we're all good. <laughs> you know, there's grace for that. Um, but this man is still left on the side of the road and desperately need, in need of help that the people before him couldn't have given him, should have given him, but didn't. Um, and who actually gives it to him is the most unlikely of people. He is a Samaritan who stops and helps a Jewish man in his time of, need, time of need. And the reason this is such a big deal that he's a Samaritan, and which is why everybody in the audience who got, Jesus was talking to would have realized this and probably gasped, is because it's a well-known fact that Samaritans and Jews are enemies of each other. Jews hate Samaritans, Samaritans hate Jews. It's always been like that. Um, so this is outrageous that in Jesus' story he says that a Samaritan of all people stops and helps the Jew, who's his enemy, not even his neighbor, his enemy. But even though this man was a Jew and was his, er his enemy, the Samaritan had compassion for this man and went out of his way to save him and put bandages on his wounds and nursed him back to health, all while paying the cost for his care with his own time and money. I remember back before we read the passage and I told you to read it as if you were a character in the story. Uh, well, I'm going to ask you to consider the fact that you and I have been and are the man beaten and dead and broken and bruised and left helpless on the side of the road as a result of our sin. The Bible tells us in Romans 3 verse 23 um, that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So this is saying that every single human on the planet has sinned other than Jesus. And the result of our sin, as a result of the, our sin, we fall terribly short of the glory of God, which is the perfection that God requires to be in his presence. And again, in Revelation 3, verse 17, it tells us that even though we think we might be worthy and that we might be in need of nothing, or that we think we're in need of nothing, we're actually wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. This is the Bible telling you that, not me. Um, but I'm telling you that too. <laughs> so we are all in desperate need of a Savior, and without one, we would die and spend eternity apart from God, which is the worst possible thing anyone can experience. But the most incredible, beautiful, wonderful, amazing, mysterious, and just awe-striking thing apart the, about this is that the story doesn't end there. There is someone capable of saving us, from our broken and sinful state, and his name is Jesus. Because right after Romans 3.23, which just finished telling us how awful we all are and how we're all sinners, there comes verse 24, which then tells us that we can all be saved and be made right with God by putting our faith in him, in Jesus. So verse 23 tells us, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and are justified by grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. In Christ Jesus. To emphasize, I keep putting this down, but I still need it. <laughs> to emphasize this even more, Romans 5, verse 6 to 10 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to, even to die. But God shows his love for us that in while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were his enemies, for if while we were his enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. So
So, what I want to tell you is that Jesus is the ultimate Good Samaritan. He came to us at just the right time to save us from our brokenness and our death and our eternal damnation due to God's righteous anger of sin that we rightly deserve. And he paid for us the ultimate price, his life, his perfect life, so that we can be reconciled and made right with God. And he did this all while we were still his enemies. We had rejected him and hated him by living our selfish ways and seeking after all kinds of different things instead of him. But because of God's immense love and grace and mercy, he sent Jesus to die for us despite all that we have done. And probably the best news is that he didn't stay dead, but he was resurrected from the grave and in doing so defeated death and sin forever so that all who repent and believe in him have life and life for all eternity. Now, yes, it's true that we are all sinners and that we are all spiritually dead, left beaten on the side of the road. But I believe it is far more personal than that because there are those of you who are feeling the weight of your mistakes and the choices you've made. And those are what have left you beaten and bruised and hurting and hopeless and half dead on the side of the road. And there are regrets that you're living with and they're holding you captive. And there are those of you who are feeling the weight and the consequences of other people's mistakes and wrongdoings. And it's what other people have done to you that has left you beaten and bruised and helpless and feeling half dead. And I want to tell you that Jesus died and paid the price for all sin. Anything wrong you have ever done, he has died for that. And anything wrong that anyone has ever done to you, he has died for that. And because when he died, he took the burden of our sins on himself and removed it from us so that we can be free from their weight and their hold on our lives. There's freedom in Christ from what haunts you. And this freedom leads to life, and it is life to the full. And there may be those of you who feel crushed and beaten and are haunted by the demands of religion and the law and you've tried to save yourself by doing all these things and by being a good person and trying to obey all the commands and you just, but you just can't let go of the times that you failed because you, try that you're try, you feel that you're trying to earn your way to God. But I want to tell you that Jesus already lived that life. He already lived the perfect life and obeyed every command and did all that for us. And he died for that too, so that we can, we can have freedom and have that burden removed from us because of what he did. So it's okay. It's okay if you aren't perfect. It's okay if you don't follow through with the commandment. It's okay if you, if you <laughs> screw up once in a while. His grace covers that. Because it's not about what you've done, but what's been done for you. And it's not about what you do what's been done for you. There's nothing you can ever do to make God love you less and there's nothing you can ever do to make God love you more. He covers both extremes with what he did on the cross. And what is required to share in his perfection and his righteousness and his perfection is simply just your belief. All you have to do is believe that he did this and give him your heart and all of your life and just say, you're perfect, I'm not. And I want to be. And you, God in his grace gives that to you. And the beautiful thing that it does, is that it doesn't stop with just the belief. That is only the beginning. Um, Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 10 says that um, for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So, the mysterious and beautiful thing about this is that when we have an understanding of our own profound need for grace and mercy, and, we are aware, and when we are aware of what we've been saved from, by the grace and mercy of Jesus, then we will naturally extend grace and mercy to others to do the same, to do the good works that God has prepared for us. And if we stand amazed at what God has done for us at the cross of of Christ, then we won't find it hard to go out of our way to help others by showing them mercy and kindness. 
uh, J.D. Greer, who I quoted once or before, once again said that when, when we experience the generosity of the gospel, we will naturally extend that generosity to others. We become people with a generous spirit, and that affects how we treat others and what we do with our money, time, and talents. God changes us by pouring out his undeserved kindness on us and by loving us in the deepest possible way. And when we experience that, our hearts are transformed. We have the ability to share that kindness and that love and that grace and that mercy with anyone we come in contact with because of what Jesus had did on the cross. Jesus was and is the ultimate good Samaritan. And who he saved and is saving is us. And therefore, we can go and do likewise and be good Samaritans to others. Just as 1 John 4 verse 9 tells us, we love because he first loved us. So if you want to bow your heads with me, I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much that you came to us in our time of need. And you're coming to us in our time of need. And you will always be there for us in our time of need. God, thank you that you sent Jesus to die on the cross, to remove our burdens, to, to free us from our sins and to make us right with you. God, we praise your name for all of this. And I, and I pray that you be with each and every one of us that that can, can work its may, way from our head to our heart and just sink in and that it can change us from the inside out and that we can just love you and, and be in awe of what you have done and that it will transform our lives. Um, Lord God, thank you for this day and thank you for everybody here. And thank you for Sparwood and the church here and all that it's doing in the community. Um, yeah, I pray all these things in your holy name. Amen.